Yeah, 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 yeah. Making her way to the mic. They start dimming the lights. You start feeling alright. From Birmingham, home of the Teddy Longs and the Ruben Studders. More once you discover. For all of the lovers, Whitney Houston and Roman Reigns. For all of the lovers, and Mickey James and Marvin Gaye. For all of the lovers, and Sasha Banks, Janelle Monet, Silk, Sonic, and Paige. Allow me to say. Look, I just found a place we'd escape For every one of us I was kinda late Cause I just made it off the struggle bus Walking by the fate Cause I know it's right in front of us Yo, I ain't with the hate Gotta focus on what's great Ladies and gentlemen Steph Hardy is on the air Had to drop a couple bars Just to make you all aware So, sit back, relax, enjoy the show You know I go by Joe or the rest of the Hey, yo, yo, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl, Stephanie Hardy. And of course, welcome to this special episode, three years high and rising word to De La Soul for the inspiration. This is the third anniversary episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. Of course, I'm your girl, Stephanie Hardy. I've been your girl, Stephanie Hardy, for the last three years, and I will continue to be, to be even be that later on, even after that point. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're watching live on any one of the live platforms, thank you for your love and your support over the past three years, y'all. Like, today is the anniversary the third year anniversary of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. When I started this show, look, I'm going to get into it a little bit later, but when I started this show, y'all couldn't see my face. (laughs) Y'all didn't know exactly who I am. Y'all could only hear my voice. But now you can see my face and we got a lot of cool stuff going on with the show. There's been so much evolution with myself, with your girl, Stephanie, the host. There's been so much of an evolution with what's going on in wrestling, period, since 2020 oh my god so much has happened since then but either way whether you are new to the journey or whether you are old to the journey if you've been rocking with me since the beginning thank you thank you thank you so 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 much for supporting HWP when it was just audio when I was just sharing clips when I am still sharing clips and transferred over to video and if you're still listening to the audio and just or either or thank you for all of your support and love over these past three years we've made it like some shows really don't be lasting that long sometimes because of life and different situations like that but I am just so happy and so blessed that I'm still here like seriously I'm so glad but of course um in the idea that this is my third anniversary I have to keep some of the same energy with a lot that I've got going on and of course if you are watching live and if you have anything that you'd like to add to this conversation or to this episode of the podcast you know light up the comments wherever you're watching and also Share, you know, share this live feed wherever you can so you can continue to get the word out and promote this show as I continue to grow and do more than the best that I possibly can for this amazing thing that I birthed. Oh my God, I'm so happy. Now, of course, this month is still very much Black History Month. Speaking of my anniversary, this is something I guess you could consider to be Black History, considering I'm a Black host in wrestling. So since this is Black History Month, let's continue to celebrate regardless of people, you know, acting up in different um, situations, whether it be in the news or stuff like that. Celebrate your heritage and love yourself. And of course, if you are not of the culture of Black people, you know, continue to try to learn from us, you know, and try to find whatever ways of which you can be an ally in a healthy way and not and not in a ratchet way 
just continue to just learn about Black history and know that you can, you know, be a part of it by continuing to help us, you know, fight for the rights that we need to survive. Or you can also help us by just talking to us and just being nice to us and not being buttholes. You know, that's also a thing you can do too. So yeah, continue to celebrate Black History Month. And seeing as HWP is a Birmingham, Alabama, Black woman-owned show, I have to say that. Now, of course, before we go any further, I have to talk um, about a segment that has been a stable in this show since the beginning. Well, not really the beginning, not even the first episode. I would say maybe the third episode. And that's news and gossip-ish. We got to talk about everything that's going on in the world of professional wrestling um, right here and right now. So, of course, we're going to start with the news that Lita might be participating in the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view again this year. Now, of course, this past Monday, she popped up on Raw to help Becky Lynch in her um, match, in her steel cage match against Bayley. And, of course, you know, Damage Control, the women's tag team champions, were trying to interfere in the match and gang up on Becky again. But earlier in the show, Becky did say, well, I have something, you know, I have a trick up my sleeve that might, you know, get Bailey together, right? So, you know, the show goes on, the show goes on. We don't really see anything else, you know, go on or anything else allude to what's about to happen in this steel cage match, which of course got moved to this Monday because of course they ran out of time on Raw 30 and everybody was mad about it, including myself. And so they moved it finally um, on this Orlando, Florida show. And it actually wound up going pretty well. Um... But once damage control started to interfere or whatnot, um, Becky had a ram in the bush to help her out. And lo and behold, it was the Hall of Famer Lita, friend of the pod and friend of me. Um, <laughs> well, we're not really friends. She met me. But either way, you know, she was still very supportive and nice to me or whatnot. But either way, she popped up on Raw to help Becky Lynch. And so now, since she popped up with an amazing ovation to help this girl, um, the rumors are running around on Fightful Select that there might be plans for Lita to participate or compete at Elimination Chamber in Montreal, in Montreal, Canada. The so forgive me if I get that wrong. Um, sorry, my Canadian viewers, I apologize for that. So the rumor is is that it might be that Trish Stratus might come back and appear on Raw next week to submit like a, I guess you could say a six woman tag between Becky, Lita, Trish, and also Damage Control. That's the rumor that's going around. But either way, I think it will really, it'll be really cool considering Trish is from Canada. And of course, Lita is her best friend and that they are definitely more than willing to get back into the ring, even though they're not, you know, a full-time action. And the fact that you're seeing Lita, um, be friends with and align herself with Becky after the time they had last year. Um, fighting for the Raw Women's title, you know, of course, when Becky was champion. Um, I thought that was a, a really interesting, you know, turn of event that now the person that you're fighting and the person that you ran in the ground is now the person that you're asking for help. And the fact that Trish Stratus might be, you know, in the midst of it, that's going to be really cool too. So I am looking forward to it if that's the case. So yeah, like you might get Trish and Lita at Elimination Chamber aligning with Becky. And also Bailey had a, another interesting moment this past Tuesday on NXT where she had her ding dong hello show with damage control. Well, not with not with damage control, but with um I'm so excited I can't really get all my thoughts out. It's almost like the first episode all over again. Um <laughs> it's like Bailey had an amazing moment with um toxic attraction on ding dong hello on nxt so she's just been kind of you know stretching herself a little bit thin when it comes to everywhere that she's going and she of course got beat up um in the steel cage match she had her arm in a sling or whatnot but either way it's gonna be cool stuff regardless so i'm really pumped about lita and um becky aligning with each other for elimination chamber which is shaping up to be a pretty solid pay-per-view heading into wrestlemania season so i'm really pumped about that and of course you know here's this picture when they were beefing like sometimes i have more pictures than i <laughs> than i think i do when it comes to these stories but yeah there's just more to it 
also um in news and gossip ish there was a very interesting part of an interesting piece of information i found out last week um involving black history month and also wwe's you know black nxt roster now i was watching a tiktok that Caden carter the former um nxt women's tag champion posted where she was dancing with a lot of women you know who are um who are black and on the NXT roster. And as she was dancing around, you saw the likes of Alicia Taylor. You saw the likes of, of course, um, Ava Rain from um, Schism, who is, of course, the daughter of Joy the Rock Johnson and Danny Garcia. You saw her. You saw um, Lash Legend. But something that really surprised everyone was when you saw Kiana James and Sol Ruka pop up in the video. And then to even, you know, solidify it even further, you saw the like the the giant graphic that WWE likes to make of its black superstars and, and they made one for NXT and Kiana James and Sol Ruka were on that graphic and it was so funny because a lot of people really did not know that Kiana James and Sol Ruka are of african-american heritage and i definitely didn't know either i was absolutely shocked so yeah as it turns out in response to everyone's comments Sol ruka posted that picture um above a picture of her and her father and lo and behold her dad is a black man <laughs> and kiana james if you look at her instagram you can see her parents and her mother is african-american and her father is a white male so i just had no clue that her that Sol Ruka and Kiana James, who is, of course, now um, an NXT Women's Tag Team Champion, along with Fallon Henley, were of African-American descent. And these are two women who have impressed me the more I have watched them on NXT. Because I know Kiana James, of course, she had a really beautiful star showing on NXT Deadline in the first ever Soul, um, not Soul Survivor match, but the... Um, Oh my god, I can't remember the name of the match. But either way, y'all know what I'm talking about. It was the first ever, um... It was the first ever, like, match where there was, like... It was a countdown and all of that. But I can't remember the name of it, and I'm so mad. But either way, um, she was in that match, and she had all kinds of amazing um spots in it and then when you also add in the idea of soul ruka who's been making lots of waves no pun intended because she likes to surf and stuff with her finisher that she does when she bounces off of the top rope and hits a cutter on her opponent like it is literally the most incredible finisher i have seen anyone do and for someone who just started training in wrestling last year when she came from the university of oregon through the nil um program with wwe she is showing amazing progress so these two women being black women really does sort of add you know some extra flavor to it and i am just so happy that these women you know are showing you know the best of themselves as athletes and i will continue to support them i was supporting them anyway but them being of african-american descent adds a little extra pride to it so i am really happy that we did find this information out and I can't wait to see more of what they have to offer um, in NXT as they continue to grow and matriculate um, through that area. So also moving forward in more news, SummerSlam will be taking place in freaking <laughs> in freaking Detroit at the Ford Center on Saturday, August the 5th. This was announced on Tuesday um, by the executive vice president of talent, Dan Ventrell, which said that the following, he basically said the following. He said, quote, we are excited for Ford Field to host WWE's biggest event of the summer and look forward to the WWE universe converging on Detroit to celebrate SummerSlam's long awaited return to Michigan. And of course, this article continued to say, say that since its inception in 1988, SummerSlam has never been held within the confines of the Motor City, although the 1993 edition of the event did take place in nearby Auburn Hills, Michigan at the Palace of Auburn Hills, which was then the home of the NBA's Detroit Pistons. So, 
of course this announcement you know came out and a lot of people had um, multiple feelings about it or whatnot even some people going as far as to say that they really weren't excited about it being in Detroit because they feel like oh well it's not that good of a neighborhood or whatever but it weirded me out because of course I've never been to Detroit I've never really been to Michigan I've only the closest I've been to Michigan it's like Lake Michigan but that's of course if you're in Chicago so I've never really been there so I can't really speak to that and I would never diss a city that I've never been to because I just feel like that's rude um but of course I have on good authority from the professor Gerard Bonner shout out to him um he stated today on women's wrestling talk live that Detroit that the area that the Ford Field is around in that area in Detroit is actually pretty cool um and they have lots of amazing stuff there including Motown themed things because of course that's where Motown is um so I won't just outright say that I don't like this idea and considering I you know considering it's not likely that I will be attending SummerSlam um, because that's also the weekend of my boyfriend's birthday. I'm just not entirely sure if I'll be there, but either way, I'm not going to say, oh, well, I don't like this choice. Now, mind you, I thought that it would have been, you know, good if they had it in Nashville again, and then it would have been closer, but either way, I mean, Detroit isn't necessarily the worst choice to me because I don't really know what type of city it is, and I would never talk crazy on somebody else's city because I don't like it when people talk crazy on my city, like, so I'm not going to do that. So shout out to Detroit for getting this big event and, you know, not really having an event like this before. So I can imagine how excited they must be to house um, SummerSlam in that way. I think that's pretty amazing. Also in the news, this is something that was really shocking and also um, pretty sad in the sense that I know what this is like on a personal level. Um, Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler um, was in the hospital. Um, he is in the hospital in Florida after suffering a stroke on Monday. Um, his longtime friend Dave Brown told um, the Memphis Commercial Appeal that he is currently recovering in a Fort Myers hospital. And he said that the two of them had an encouraging interaction over FaceTime on Tuesday afternoon. And he's quoted as saying, some of the initial reports were just horrible. So I feel much better than I did 18 hours ago when I felt like I got hit in the face with a shovel. Brown said, I was incredibly encouraged after I did a FaceTime. Jerry was alert. He talked to me. He could only say a couple of words at a time, which is normal but he was able to move both legs and both arms. And I feel very optimistic that he's eventually going to recover. Now, he was in Florida to attend the old time comic shows, Heroes Meet Horror Con um, in Punta Gorda. And now he's, and now, and then Laura, and then Lala was going to spend the rest of the week in the condo that he owns in Florida. So, this isn't the first time he's had a moment like this because if you remember, if you're a wrestling fan, you remember that in 2012, he suffered a heart attack on live television on commentary and they took him away um, to a nearby medical place. Um, I mean, a nearby medical facility. And he wound up recovering from that. And then Michael Cole wound up having to carry the rest of commentary on his own after that point. And he hasn't been working full time with the company since then. You know, every now and then he'll pop up and do um, pre-show panels. And then some and then most recently he was on Raw 30 doing guest commentary for a second. So this saddened me to hear that he had suffered a stroke, but I am glad that he has movement of both of his limbs. Um, and this is something I know about personally due to having dealt with stroke in family members of my own it's a really rough and debilitating thing to have to recover from. Um, and there are some people in life who have gone through that and not really survived it. Um, so I'm glad that he was able to recover from it and only say a few words, but you know, a few words is better than no words at all. So I hope that he does continue to get better um, and just, you know, get his life back from that because that can be really, really rough. Um, so moving forward into a less, um, well, not a less serious, but just a little bit more lighthearted situation involving another storyline going on in wrestling. Paul Heyman and Cody Rhodes 
had an amazing interaction this past Monday on Raw where they had a very heartfelt and cutting promo with each other, talked about how much they respected each other. Um, And Cody Rose actually opened up and talked about all the ways in which Paul Heyman was actually there for his family when they were on dire straits and how he actually helped the late Dusty Rhodes, the American Dream, get his courage, well, not his courage, but his confidence back. Um, after having not been on television for a while and actually gave him an opportunity to earn some money when they when the Rose family fell on dire straits and didn't have enough money to really survive. Paul Heyman did that and Cody Rose mentioned that on TV and it was a very heartfelt moment that the both of these men had and it was a very beautiful moment until of course Paul Heyman took it there <laughs> in a very negative way. So um Speaking on the Wrestling Observer radio show, Dave Meltzer, who, of course, you do have to take the grain of salt because everything that he says has been proven to not be true at times and true and, and be true at sometimes as well. Um, WWE officials were well aware of how hot the angle between Reigns and Sami Zayn has gotten, and they knew it was imperative to do something big in order to shine the spotlight on the upcoming WrestleMania main event between Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns. And their promos, and of course, this promo on Monday was a part of that, and they knocked it out of the park, of course, building more anticipation for WrestleMania 39. Now, in this promo, Paul Heyman interrupted Cody Rhodes and congratulated him on winning the Rumble, but then he also reminded him that winning... um, the main event of WrestleMania would be a totally different animal, which is, of course, something that Roman Reigns has done multiple times, right? But Cody, of course, like I said, mentioned how um, Paul Heyman saved his family um, from dire straits, and Heyman really did start crying. Like, he was crying full-on tears. And he was just like, oh, you always know how to get me in the heart. And I was just like, you know what, Cody Rhodes, you remind me of me when I write When I write inside my Hallmark cards that I buy for people, it's just you write it and then you hit the person dead in the heart with your real feelings and they just start crying and it's a moment and it's cool. So he did, of course, get a little bit factual when he told Cody that his dad did not get a chance to really train him um, the way that Dusty was able to train so many stars of today like Becky Lynch and like Kevin Owens and like Roman Reigns at the Performance Center before he passed away. And then he went on to say that in the last conversation that he had with Dusty, he said that Cody was his favorite son, but he does wish that Roman Reigns was, he he said that Roman Reigns was the son that he wished he had. And Cody didn't like that. <laughs> Cody didn't like it. He was pissed. So after he was pissed off, he walked up to him, shook his hand like real tight and told him, look at here. I'm just trying to win a championship, but everybody keeps trying to get personal with me. So since y'all trying to keep, keep y'all keep trying to get personal with me, when I go to WrestleMania and beat your boy, I'm taking those titles personally. And I was like, Oh, that's a bar. That is a bar right there. But the crazy part about it is when you have someone like Cody who is on this warpath to get these titles and basically, you know, fulfill his father's dream of being WWE champion. You have the Sami Zayn of it all leading into Elimination Chamber and, and Sammy is white hot right now ever since he betrayed the bloodline and even before then. So Lord knows how all of this is going to explode. But either way, I'm really excited about how all of it is going to main, how, how all of it is going to manifest itself. Because either way, I'm going to be entertained and I get to go. So I'm just like, okay, fine let's do this let's do it let's go on this ride and let's just enjoy it for what it's worth and hopefully we won't crash on the way there so if you haven't watched that promo between paul Heyman and cody rose i do suggest you do watch it though because it was phenomenal absolutely phenomenal so moving forward with more news and gossip the rock showed up 
at the Grammys this past Sunday, and it set wrestling Twitter on fire because everybody was pissed off that a lot of their predictions and fantasy bookings for him participating in WrestleMania this year, including mine, um, because it was in Hollywood and stuff, you know, doesn't really seem to be panning out with the whole bloodline situation and Cody Rhodes situation and Sami Zayn of it all. And honestly, there really isn't that much of a need for The Rock in this um, stage of the storytelling with WrestleMania. But a lot of people really did think, okay, well, this is his time. He's going to come back and he's going to fight Roman and it's going to be the battle of, you know, the Anawaii men, right? But it doesn't seem like that's really what's going to happen. And I've made peace with the fact that maybe that's not a bad thing. Even though I was one of those people that was pushing for The Rock to fight Roman, I'm not really pushing that hard for it anymore because I'm just like, okay, well, if it's not going to happen, then I'm okay with that. But either way, The Rock was at the Grammys and him and Adele became best friends because Adele really was a fan of his and she wanted to meet him. So Trevor Noah, who was operating as the host of the Grammys, decided, okay, well, you know, here's a chance for you guys to meet. And they met up at her table. And then, of course, she won a Grammy that night and he actually presented it to her and she was so happy about it. So, yeah, that was really cool. And he, of course, attended the Grammys with his wife, Lauren Hashian, who is also a musician herself. So I thought that was really interesting and really cool that they were there to support each other in that way. Um, but the idea of him being there really did piss a lot of wrestling fans off. They were just like, oh, so he can show up to the Grammys, but he can't show up to WrestleMania. He can show up to the Grammys and be here for Adele, but can't be here for the Royal Rumble. And yeah... And then it doesn't help that the Grammys were in Los Angeles, too, along with Mania being in Los Angeles. So it's just, oh, God. It just feels like here lately, The Rock really can't do anything right at this point. Because, of course, you know, he's not a part of WrestleMania this year as it stands now. And then... There was a whole Black Adam situation where it seemed like he wanted Black Adam to be its own separate thing away from the DCEU. And then everybody was like, oh, well, he messed it up and now they're redoing it and it's his fault. And it's just so much going on. And I just feel like, you know what, Rock, maybe a comeback in wrestling could do you some good if it's done right. But people were angry <laughs> people were just really mad at him so either way this is where we're at in life um but the rock did look like he had a good time at the grammys so hey whatever also in the news we have mandy Sachs, um formerly known as mandy rose in wwe she made an appearance on the sessions with renee paquette um, and she talked about the possibility of her maybe, you know, returning to wrestling in the future. And she is quoted as to saying um, to Renee that um, it would be nice if she did, you know, team with Dustin Rhodes again, like they did with the Mixed Match Challenge. She um, said that her return returning to wrestling isn't something that she's completely ruled out. But right now, it's just not her primary focus. And I completely understand that. Like she, she's only a few months removed from being released from the WWE, all because of her fan time website that she had, where she was making extra money on the side. Of course, you know, sharing all of that adult content. But at the same time, I almost feel like firing her for that was just a little bit much, um, especially when you consider the fact that she was a beautiful va she is a beautiful va va boom type of girl and y'all were leaning into it so much when it came to her character on the main roster and on nxt but then when it comes to her you know having agency over her own body and using it you know to you know to make more money it's like y'all want to be mad about it and you release her and then leave toxic attraction to be a two-woman group and now it's no longer a group anymore and it's just really sad but either way Mandy Rose appears to be in good spirits and she appears to be, you know, doing a pretty okay job with her modeling stuff that she's doing along with her Demandy's Donuts business that her and Sonya Deville have together as best friends. But I hope that if she does return to wrestling, she would return to WWE just to, you know, I guess fix things. But I feel like 
now with the direction of Toxic Attraction and now how they've separated and now JC betraying Gigi, I almost feel like Toxic Attraction will probably never get back together in that sense. But Mandy does. I feel like Mandy really did deserve to be a star and that maybe this year she would have been called up or maybe her and the other Toxic Girls would have been called up together and they would have gone for a run at the tag titles. But now Mandy's gone and Toxic split up and it's just like, dang, it's just a really tough situation. But I'm glad to see that Mandy is doing well um, and, you know, in good spirits. So yeah it's really sad but we have to live and do the best we can so in more news we have wow women of wrestling um doing high ratings yet again i'm so excited now via wrestlenomics there were there were numbers released on um their ratings and how they've sort of grown since they've, you know, restarted their show in syndication now. So according to WrestleNomics, um, WoW, WoW's ratings have been tripled over um, Impact Wrestling's um, viewership yet again because Impact's um, viewership was watched by 95,000 viewers. Meanwhile, WoW on January the 22nd was drew in 326,000 viewers with a 0.5% um, percent 18 ages, 18 through 49 rating. Now, this isn't me throwing shade at Impact at all because I love Impact and I love all the things that they have going on, um, especially with their women's division with um, Mickey James at the helm as the Impact um, Knockouts Champion. Even though she's getting bullied by Bully Ray and I'm gonna need for him to chill the F out. But either way, it's like their viewership has been growing and even though wow's um they the wrestlenomics article also said that wow's viewership also dropped a little bit this weekend but i tend to think that or at least maybe a part of me you know assumes that wow's viewership tends to drop on the saturdays in which there's another pay-per-view going on <laughs> and this and um not this past well yeah this past saturday there was nxt vengeance day and then you also have the royal rumble which took place a couple of weeks ago too and so it's just like since wwe has moved their premium live events to saturdays instead of sundays now there's a bit of counter programming that's going on with them because of course they have their pre-shows before they have pay-per-views so there might be a little bit of a dip when it comes to that but either way i am happy that wow women of wrestling is getting more viewership um and they are saying that there is a higher percentage of men watching the show than it is women. But I think that's pretty par for the course when it comes to wrestling as a whole. Um, I find that when it comes to wrestling as a whole, um, men are more likely to flock to it, you know, in that way, because it's a male dominated industry. Um, but a number of women, a chunk of women do watch it. So I believe that this is just an, another way in which women's wrestling is continuing to rise and grow in numbers and show that people really do care about it and that women do care about women's wrestling as well. So this was really good to see. I'm glad that WOW Women of Wrestling is having a moment where people are consistently watching it and their viewership is growing. I'm really happy about that. And also, if you haven't had an opportunity, check out the WOW um, Superheroes After Show on Women's Wrestling Talk that I host with um, Katrina from NCAT We Trust and um, Emily May so on Mondays so please check that out as well and I believe of course when I started the Hardy Wrestling Podcast it was called Hardy Wrestling with Stephanie Hardy and this is very this is a very vulnerable part for me because I had no idea what I was doing <laughs> I only had two podcast apps on my phone because of the idea that I was affiliated with a former, with a wrestling group on Facebook who did express interest in starting a podcast. And so I kept both of those apps on my phone, Anchor being one of them in the hopes that we would start one but it just never happened and of course um since i left that group due to just differences of um stuff and leadership and so many different things i just needed a place where i can put all of my wrestling thoughts you know in a 
healthy and positive manner. And so that's why I started the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. And like I said, when it started, this was the first logo. Um, You can make your own logo on the Anchor app. And this is what I started with. It was Hardy Wrestling with Stephanie Hardy because I was afraid that no one would know my name if I just called it the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. I did not trust my gut when it came to calling it the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. So I called it Hardy Wrestling with Stephanie Hardy. And I was just like, okay, well, this is it. And I put it out and I put out my first episode which was called Random Girl Random Podcast and it's still up if you ever want to go back and listen to it. I believe this is one of my highest listened to or highest viewed um, episodes of the podcast ever because you can hear you know where I started it was only 34 minutes Um, nowhere near as long as it is now or can be at times. But in the when I listen back to the episode, you can tell that I was either fighting a cold (laughs) or, you know, just I just sounded really nervous or scared. And I was saying um a lot. And then there wasn't really a separation of segments either. It was just me just continuing to talk. And I would pause in between to give off the effect that there was a segment. But I had no clue how to edit back then either. So I was just doing the best that I could. And I had, you know, just this music in the background going that felt a lot like, like an instrumental that you would hear in the background of like a radio thing or something like that. So it was just really interesting how it turned out. Um, And the name of the episode was Random Girl Random Podcast because like I said, before I had started in wrestling media, I was just a girl living with her parents, didn't have a job um, at the time because I was let go from one and I just, I was just full of so much creative energy. And then I was still watching wrestling, you know, to just sort of cope with everything going on. And I just needed a place to put my thoughts and that's how it happened. And, oh, I'm just so happy I did that. Um, But at the time, this was before the pandemic because the pandemic started in March of 2020. This was February of 2020. So on this day, three years ago, this is when the episode came out. And I talked about my subject matter was about the Royal Rumble of 2020 and the events that took place afterwards. So I decided that it would be good to go back down memory lane and sort of discuss everything that happened with that Royal Rumble. And of course, equate it to what's going on now since um, Royal Rumble has just passed and we're on the road to WrestleMania again. So (laughs) this is the fire that they have for the Royal Rumble in 2020. And as you can see, you have the likes of, of Mandy Rose, you have Natalia, Asuka, Kyrie Sane, you have Charlotte there, Becky, you had Mercedes Monet there, Lacey. And on the men's side, you have Big E, you got Kofi, you got The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, you got Ray, you got Braun, you got AJ Styles, The Miz, Brock Lesnar, and of course, Roman Reigns. And when you go back and look at pictures like this, it sort of sends you on like, it sends you back down memory lane and you're just thinking about, man, this is really what wrestling looked like back then. And of course, um, this Royal Rumble took place, you know, at the Minute Maid Park um, in Texas. I believe this is Houston, Texas. Um, and this is a baseball field. And I believe this is where the Houston Astros play. And I hate the Houston Astros. <laughs> I do not like them because I'm an Atlanta Braves fan through and through. So the Astros are like my biggest rivals. I'm just so happy that, you know, they beat them in the World Series in 2021. So, hey. But either way, this is a beautiful facility. Minute Maid Park was just a really cool place to have a Royal Rumble. Um, And of course, you know, as I talk about a couple of matches that took place, there were a couple of matches that took place where they actually fought in levels of the dugout. And the baseball nerd in me was really cool and happy about that fact. So it was interesting. And then, of course, you know, you can never really go wrong with Houston because it's the home of Beyonce is where Beyonce is from. And of course, you know, she's iconic and amazing, legendary goat status, Virgoat, who shares the same birthday as me, who had an amazing weekend weekend. 
at the Grammys. Um, but this really has nothing to do with wrestling. I just wanted an excuse to bring up Beyonce because when you think of when I think of Houston, Texas, I think about her and her sister, um, and also Megan Thee Stallion too. Um, and they're just great women who come from Houston, Texas. So shout out to Beyonce. I love you. Um, <laughs> So, of course, when you think about this Royal Rumble from this year, um, this took place in San Antonio, Texas at the Alamo Dome. And, of course, you have Bobby Lashley and you also have Brock Lesnar again and Becky Lynch again and Roman Reigns again in this um, flyer. And then you also have a number of other people in the flyer as well, but this is a cut version of it. And then they had electricity surrounding it. And this is where a lot of people kind of went crazy with their rock theories. But of course that didn't happen. So um, that's where we were at with that. But either way, this is kind of where what the flyers looked like in comparison. You had red and white with the other one. But in this one, it was a little bit more um, intense and very superhero-ish and stuff. So that was really cool. Then, oh, and this is, yeah, this is how the Alamo Dome looks. I forgot that I put that picture there. But yeah. Um, but when it comes to matches, Roman Reigns, you know, in 2020, he was having a really interesting beef with King Corbin. This is when Corbin, Baron Corbin, had won the King of the Ring um, tournament. And he really let the whole King thing go to his head, which is par for the course when you win um, the King of the Ring tournament, except if you're Xavier Woods, he won it and it didn't really go to his head. He was just really happy, okay? Because that was his dream. But either way, Baron Corbin was just, is an evil heel, so he was just like, yeah, I'm going to treat everybody like crap because I'm the king. And he kept messing with Roman Reigns, who was, of course, face at this time because he was making his return from having survived leukemia. And so... He was in remission and this was where we were, you know, cheering for him. Some people were booing him, but at the same time, the cheers were louder because um, he was a face and he had just returned from battling a debilitating disease. And so he kept messing with him. And then there was one point where I believe Baron Corbin poured dog food on the big dog on an episode of SmackDown. And this was kind of unpopular with people from what I remember, but either way, this led to them having a match, a Falls Count Anywhere match at the Royal Rumble. And like I said, they were fighting all over the place, even in the dugout. And I was just like, oh, that's so cool. And then when Baron Corbin tried to um, enlist the help of Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode, because I'm still never calling him Robert Roode, never going to do that. I don't care. It's been three years. I'm still never calling him Robert Roode. It's Bobby, okay? His mama named him Bobby. I'm calling him Bobby. Whatever. Um, and so since Roman Reigns needed help, he enlisted the help of the Usos, who are, of course, his real life cousins and the twins, Jimmy and Jay. And they actually fought, you know, tooth and nail and actually helped Roman Reigns win that match at the Royal Rumble. And of course, Roman Reigns would go on to... Um, participate in that Royal Rumble in 2020 but not be successful in it and I'll get to that later but it's so funny when you look at these guys as a face um alignment in 2020 and then you look at them now <laughs> three years ago I never would have saw this coming um an entire faction based on the idea that they are Related, They're the NOI bloodline. You got Jimmy and Jay as the tag team champions. The you, the unite, like they, mm, the unified tag team champions. And you got Roman with both the titles. Now you got Paul Heyman, who's aligned and disaligned and aligned again with them as well. And then you have the other drama, which we'll get into later on on the show as well, tied into that as well. So it's just like three years ago, I never would have seen Roman Reigns turning heel from where he was. Um, disappearing at that, because when you think about the pandemic and him being immunocompromised due to his um, status as a leukemia survivor, it was a while where we didn't see him leading into the pandemic. And when we saw him again, he popped up and he was heel and then he popped up with Paul Heyman and that's how all of this bloodline stuff came into motion and it's just so insane when you think about it it started off so small and it just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and, grew and look at where we're at oh my god the insanity of it all Woo, it's crazy 
and then also if you had told me three years ago that Jay Uso would have had a chance to show that he could be a solo champion I wouldn't have believed that either but that happened and it's insane it's really insane how that happened like it's insane oh it's crazy then you also have Baron Corbin now and he and how he aligned himself with JBL, a Hall of Famer. And JBL was calling him the modern day wrestling god. But as of Monday, they're no longer together or aligned with each other because JBL is tired of Baron Corbin losing. And he told him he was a waste of time. And he also called him a turd too, which I thought was really unkind. And Baron Corbin looked really sad about it. But also, I believe that this is what y'all get for throwing shade at people from Alabama even though I know my boyfriend will probably chime in and say no he wasn't talking about us specifically because he mentioned the word on the show he mentioned the word rednecks but I feel like if you talk about anybody from Alabama you're talking about all of us and anytime you diss us all collectively then no then nothing you do will prosper after that and that's why Baron and JBL are not prospering right now so that's what they get that's what y'all get y'all get bad look you're not lasting long neither one of you are wrestling gods i don't care next (laughs) when it comes to the women's royal rumble of 2020 um when i was looking up different factoids when it comes to the royal rumble of 2020 you have people who came in at um number one or number two or at least number two and number three, I think. And Bianca came in this Royal Rumble. This was her very first Royal Rumble because at this time she was still with NXT. And she was gunning for the NXT Women's title at the time. And then Alexa Bliss was also a participant in this Royal Rumble. And this is them sort of fighting in the Women's Royal Rumble match as either, um, I believe, as either number one or number two. And or number two or number three either way i thought this was very interesting when you look back and then you look ahead now at this year's royal rumble and they fought each other with bianca of course now being raw women's champion and alexa being a former champion herself seeking to sort of gain that glory back but also dealing with the ghosts of her issues with bray wyatt like i thought that was pretty sick going back and looking at that it's just like wow these women really were you know in this royal rumble in 2020 trying to have a chance to challenge for whatever title they wanted and now look at them having a match together three years later it's insane now of course bianca wound up setting a record which i believe since has been broken um for all the eliminations that she had in this Royal Rumble match. Because as you can see right here, she's lifting up Candice LeRae, who is a part of the Raw roster now. And she had a number of eliminations here. She had on a really simple gear where she was dressed up in gold and black, which, you know, now that I think about it, could have been a theme for NXT and representing NXT in that really unique way. Because of course, you know, she makes her own gear. But either way, she wound up setting a record there. And even though she didn't win this Royal Rumble, she had an amazing showing. And of course, after that, she had a little bit of a beef going on with Rhea Ripley for the NXT Women's title. Um, But Rhea was gunning for Charlotte Flair to challenge her because Charlotte had went on to win the Women's World Rumble that year. And Charlotte decided, well, fine, I'm going to go to NXT and challenge you since you want to fight me so bad. And Bianca was like, look, you ain't finna ignore me because I'm challenging Rhea for the NXT Women's title first. You don't even go here. (laughs) But then Charlotte was disrespectful. She was like, nah, this is a conversation for champions. You need to move out the way. And Bianca didn't take too kindly to that. And it's so funny when you fast forward and look at um, the Royal Rumble in 2021 and these three women were the last three left. And I believe either, I believe Rhea eliminated Charlotte from the 2021 Royal Rumble and the, and the final two were Bianca and Rhea and Bianca won that year and went on to main event WrestleMania with Mercedes Monet. And then Rhea won the Raw Women's title at that WrestleMania that year. But it's almost like you barely remember it because of the way she was booked. And then she wound up losing a little bit later to Charlotte again. And it was just, she was on the struggle bus a little bit after that. So 
this picture is telling for me like it's really funny because storyline wise you know from a fan's perspective it almost looked like they were trying to undermine Bianca and as it turns out Bianca wound up you know being on top and a champion um and Rhea sort of became the odd girl out because like I said Charlotte challenged her and wound up winning the NXT women's title off of her so and then charlotte went on to have more success after that so it's crazy but like i said charlotte wound up winning the royal rumble and doing all of that and they fought at wrestlemania in 2020 which was of course the first wrestlemania without a crowd due to the pandemic popping off and they fought each other in the performance center and um watching this wrestlemania was awkward but i still pushed through anyway because I wasn't going to give up on wrestling during the pandemic at all because this was one of the things here again was keeping this and also doing the podcast and talking about wrestling was one of the things that was keeping me sane um, outside of prayer and therapy because the pandemic was really hard for me because I'm an extrovert and I like to go out and interact with people and do things and seeing as that wasn't really an option outside of you know going to the store and going to work if you were an essential worker and going home there wasn't a lot really to do at that point even though in Alabama the jury is out on whether or not we took it seriously but either way um in the beginning of it in the throes of it it was really rough but wrestling kept going they were still putting forth an effort to give us a show and that's something that I will always admire wrestling for doing that in the hardest of times they never gave up on us and continued to entertain us and show us love and this match was a part of that and Rhea came out dressed like Vegeta which I low-key feel like was an omen for how she lost the NXT women's title because Vegeta always gets beat by who? Goku and that's just what happened here um but now we fast forward to 2023 And these two are fighting at WrestleMania because Rhea won the Royal Rumble this year and challenged Miss Charlotte again. So everything comes full circle somehow. And three is the magic number. And it took three years for Rhea to get back, um, get her attitude back, as some would say, and join the Judgment Day, get her attitude back. And now she's challenging Charlotte again at WrestleMania. And this is something I'm looking forward to. So I'm pumped. Then if you look into the Women's Royal Rumble again, you see Liv Morgan here um, sort of coming at coming in at number seven in the Rumble in 2020. And this was where she was coming out as the possible lover of Lana because Lana, of course, had embarrassed Rusev and then Rusev either left the company or got released. And Lana was marrying Bobby Lashley. And then there was a number of people crashing the wedding, um, including, I believe, Electra Lopez, even though she wasn't Electra Lopez at the time. And then Liv crashed the wedding. And she was like, bro, like, we were lovers. How could you marry him? And this sent shockwaves throughout the entire wrestling family. Because we were all like, yo, they're doing this, this storyline. And this is how Liv Morgan is coming back. And then you had people of the... Um, LGBTQIA plus community who didn't necessarily take too kindly to it either because they were making it seem like you know coming out was like a shock value thing used for well yeah it was like a storyline used for a shock value type of thing instead of a more layered type of storyline which is something that I absolutely agree with them on but they wound up you know erasing that they wound up deleting that and making live into sort of like a dominatrix type of thing because this outfit was cute um and she and this was sort of where she started evolving a whole lot more on her own because she was mostly known as the riot squad girl with ruby soho um who was ruby riot at the time and sarah logan so this was really interesting and she actually wound up eliminating lana getting back at her for of course breaking her heart and all of that and i believe lana also eliminated her from the royal rumble as well that year and of course lana had a pretty rough go of it after that point after being with bobby and then bobby dumped her and then after that point you know she was in the tag division with trinity slash naomi but then after that point you know she wanted to be taken more seriously as a wrestler but it just wasn't happening and she wound up getting released um and of course her and 
Miro slash Rusev are still a married couple. They're still together. And as far as I know, he is still signed with AEW with a question mark. Because we haven't really seen him on programming. But either way, that's what they were doing in 2020. Um, And now you fast forward and Liv, Mama Liv, has of course won Money in the Bank. She's become Miss Money in the Bank. And also in that same night, she fought back her doubters and detractors by cashing in and becoming the SmackDown Women's title and cashing in on Ronda Rousey. Now, of course, she would go on to lose at Extreme Rules in an Extreme Rules match, which made me kind of sad because that match wasn't necessarily the best it could have been. But either way, Liv Morgan is still, you know, a, a pretty solid staple on SmackDown now. Um, as this more extreme character that's seeking to inflict pain on others and herself if that's what it takes and she's of course still hungry and wanting opportunity and wanting to be the champion again so yeah that's where Liv Morgan is and of course three years ago I never would have pictured her as a champion but she really did step it up over these past couple years and I am proud of her with that then in more Mandy things Mandy in 2020 was in the greatest love story ever told in wrestling, period. (laughs) Or at least one of the greatest, you know, love stories um, that I've experienced in the modern era. She was in the Royal Rumble with a very beautiful Va Va Voom gold outfit that I'm more than sure my boyfriend drooled over at some point, but whatever. Um, Mandy's that girl. She's she's beautiful. I get it. Um, But at one point when it looked like she was about to get eliminated... Otis, who was with heavy um, heavy machinery at the time, helped her not get eliminated in a very creative way by using his body mask to keep her feet off of the floor. And I thought that was so cute because their love story was just the stuff of legends. Like, because of course in real life, you never really think that someone who is as gorgeous as Mandy Rose would ever be with someone like Otis, but... And then, of course, they had a lot of ups and downs when it came to Valentine's Day because Otis asked her out on a day for Valentine's Day and she accepted. But then Dolph wound up showing up. So she wound up, you know, you know, I guess in entertaining him. But then eventually towards um, WrestleMania season and towards the proper pay-per-view itself, they wound up sealing the deal and actually becoming an on-screen couple. And I just thought this was the cutest thing back then. Like, I just loved it. Um, I just really loved it. It was just a beautiful love story indeed. And kudos to um, the person who wrote that story because I believe she came out on Twitter when she did get released from the company and talked about how that was, how proud she was to write that story. So kudos to her um, if she's listening somewhere because I really enjoyed this. I loved it um, because I just love love. I love romance. So I thought this was a really amazing thing. Um And yeah, this is more of the outfit that she wore in the Royal Rumble 2020. And yeah, she didn't win, but either way, it was a very memorable moment for her. Um, And this was them on SmackDown, of course, you know, with more of their love story going on. And it was just a really fun time (laughs) to enjoy stuff like that. Now, of course, she would go on to um, do stuff on the main roster in the tag team division and stuff like that. But after that point, her and Sonya fell out. Um... And they split up. And then, of course, she went back to NXT, um, rebranded herself, dyed her hair (laughs) brunette, which was something I was never expecting at all, and aligned herself with Gigi Dolan and JC Jane. And then they became the faction known as Toxic Attraction. And they won all the gold at one point. And they were basically like um, NXT's female answer to the Undisputed Era. they won all the gold and it was really cool for what it was you had all these beautiful women just acting like they were just above everyone and you know they were smoking hot a lot of the time and it was just like yeah look at us and of course sadly like i mentioned before she's been released and now toxic traction is no longer a thing they're no longer a tag team and Gigi got kicked in the face by jc um and had her head dang near crushed in the door um on ding dong hello so but i will say this though they had an amazing showing at nxt vengeance day in their match against roxanne perez for the nxt women's title um Gigi 
had a fan like basically had like a collection of people you know showing her love with a fan that had her letters spelled out gg and it's looking like she really might be the face you know going forward and jc of course being the evil sean michaels-esque of it all so yeah here's hoping for the best for these women in all aspects then of course in the women's royal rumble in 2020 you had this moment miss trinity came out with natural natural fro and she made a return after being gone for a while I believe dealing with an injury and when she came back there was a huge ovation for her and i love this so much because as a person who's been natural for over for over 10 years i appreciated and loved this afro so much and of course you know it set the internet ablaze there were women black women who hadn't watched wrestling in in so long who were willing to get back in it because of the idea that she popped up with this hairstyle and with all of her colors and everything like this was just a real this was a cultural reset that i really hate the wwe didn't take that much of an advantage of because of course after this moment she did go on to challenge bailey for the smackdown women's title at super showdown but either way this moment was absolutely beautiful i loved 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 it um this was amazing for representation and i feel like even though now we are where we are now, I just really wish that they had just treated her better when it came to, you know, realizing how much of a star that she is and just utilizing her more and valuing her more. But, you know, either way, I wish the best for Trinity, regardless to what she does um, with the rest of her life and career. Um, yeah it's just a sucky situation but we'll always have this and i'll always have this in 2020 because they even wrote about this in essence magazine and i was just really excited about it because you know just it was just a combination of both of my worlds you have wrestling mixed in with black media and i loved it so respect to trinity always then you had a SmackDown women's title match between Bailey and Lacey Evans, who of course was still the um, Southern Belle back then. But um, apparently now they're not doing they're not doing that anymore because of course they've changed her character multiple times. She was the good Marine Corps soldier, and then now she's a Marine Corps. Um, sort of drill sergeant type of thing where she's being evil and just tearing apart her opponents but here that didn't necessarily help Bailey wound up winning and retaining her title and like I mentioned before she went on to have a program with Naomi um, for the Smackdown Women's title at Super Showdown um, overseas I believe in Saudi Arabia and that was I believe the second women smash that they had over there um so i so that was a pretty historic moment for the both of them um in 2020 but either way that happened and of course now bailey is the leader of a faction in damage control with the women's tag team champions dakota kai and eo sky formerly eo shirai and um i talked about Lacey, so there's that part then you had the raw women's title match between becky lynch who was the raw women's champion at this point and Asuka and Asuka was a villain back then I believe and she had aligned herself of course with the Kabuki warrior Kyrie Sane and this match was pretty good for the most part when I went back and watched it and of course you know since heel Asuka was being heel Asuka she did the mist but it wound up not working to her advantage and of course Becky retained and then it's so funny when you think about the Kabuki warriors and how you know they were a pretty fresh tag team for the most part um and um with that but then it wound up not lasting long past um 2020 because um during the pandemic era the golden role models became a thing in the form of bailey and um sasha slash mercedes and then Kyrie saying left um in ring action with wwe and continued to work as an ambassador for them in japan and then officially left the company and now she's the i the inaugural iwgp women's world champion um set to face off against mercedes monet at battle in the valley and then now you have oscar channeling back her kana stuff where she's being a terrifying buzzsaw of a woman 
and she's getting her attitude back and I love it <laughs> I absolutely love it this is where we're at um, but yeah like I mentioned before Kyrie is fighting Mercedes Monet for the women's championship at Battle in the Valley um, next weekend as a matter of fact and it's so funny because I don't feel like a lot of people are even really discussing this but I feel like people really don't understand like Elimination Chamber and Bell in the Valley are on the same day and no one's discussing it. And I know that Elimination Chamber is in Canada and Bell in the Valley is in San Jose. But y'all, how come more people aren't talking about this? You have the biggest free agent in all of women's wrestling fighting Kyrie Sane, you know, with another level of wrestling in the Japanese strong style and you have Elimination Chamber going on at the same time. What? What the heck? I just never thought this would ever happen. But here again, this is one of those tough situations I was talking about with Trinity. Where everything popped off. Where her and Mercedes walked out of the company. Because they felt like they weren't being valued. And all of that rigmarole. And now here we are. But either way, I'm still excited for this. Um, and it's just funny. Here again, the evolution of things. Then we also had Daniel Bryan slash Bryan Danielson fighting the Fiend Bray Wyatt for the universal title um, that Bray Wyatt had. Y'all remember when he was champion? Um, They fought each other in a strap match because I believe leading up to this, I believe they even had an encounter at a SmackDown here in Birmingham um, before this rumble where the reason why Daniel Bryan had short hair was because um Bray Wyatt the Fiend attacked him and ripped his hair out in front of us like it was so crazy and then he cut his hair and came back and he challenged him to a strap match and this was a pretty tough this was tough to watch in some areas because it's like you had like blisters and belt wounds and ugh, it was bad um but either way Bray Wyatt wound up retaining the universal title and it's really crazy when you really think about the idea that he was champion and everybody went up for it and everybody was happy about it but then you had some people who felt like well he's this mystical being he really shouldn't necessarily have the title but then you have a lot of diehard Bray Wyatt fans who felt like you know he deserved this right but then at the same time WWE kind of just you know snatched it backwards with their progress and had him lose to Goldberg yes if I'm remembering correctly Bray Wyatt lost this to Goldberg um, at Super Showdown and everybody was angry and they made it seem like you know this was the end of Bray Wyatt and it was just a lot going on it was a very polarizing subject for a lot of people but yeah it was it was crazy now of course um now um when it comes to the royal rumble side of things in 2023 he has a somewhat of a new persona where he's sort of channeling his inner shadow man from the princess and the frog um and collecting these people call um the wyatt six maybe and he's also affiliated with this mystical being called uncle howdy who hurts him sometimes but then also helps him sometimes as well so it's just kind of different but this was from their pitch black match that they had that he had with la knight which of course he won and it was just really crazy stuff going on here but i do like his character work now and i'm glad that creative is actually allowing him the time to sort of just let it cook and let it marinate so yeah and of course, Brian Danielson is wrestling for AEW now, and he's on this quest to fight the best of the best in order to qualify to challenge MJF for the AEW championship. So that's where we're at. And also his theme song is a whole bop. Like, seriously, it's a bop. I love it. Now, when you get to the men's Royal Rumble side of things of 2020, Drew McIntyre shockingly eliminated Brock Lesnar, who was the WWE champion at the time. And he decided that he was going to enter in the match for some weird reason. I felt like this was stupid. I was like, Brock, if you're the champion and all these people are fighting to face you, why are you in it? It just didn't make any sense to me. But either way, he was in the match and he was bullying people and throwing out people. He threw out Big E. I believe at one point, I believe he threw out Kofi. He threw out a lot of folks. But folks was getting tired of him eliminating folks. So Ricochet tried his best to, you know, hit him and beat up on him. And that didn't work. So when Ricochet actually kicked him, Drew McIntyre 
hit the final shot with the claymore kick and dumped him over the top rope and i thought that was so cool um it was so cool because i'm just like holy ish like everybody was cheering and it was like yeah brock's good you know and because he didn't need to win it he really didn't and so i know a lot of people give drew mcintyre credit for eliminating him but it was drew and ricochet and of course ricochet went on to you know fight brock lesnar in a match and it didn't necessarily pan out too well for him but either way you know this was a really cool moment to watch them both, you know, eliminate him within a shocking way. And this wouldn't be the last time this would happen to him either. Um, now, Drew, of course, um, went on to eliminate Roman Reigns, who decided to insert himself in this match. And of course, not a lot of people were happy about that because him and Royal Rumbles have a complicated history. <laughs> and of course, Drew McIntyre went on to eliminate Roman and win the championship and challenge um Brock for that WWE championship at that WrestleMania and he wound up winning. So it all turned out really well for the most part for Drew McIntyre. You know, he had gone on this odyssey to sort of make himself better and mature himself more when it came to his wrestling game because Vince McMahon at one time, you know, picked him out and said that he was the next he was up next, right? But he wasn't ready. He wasn't mature enough yet. And so he, you know, got fired and then he went and improved himself, got better in the ring, you know, you know, perfected his his persona and came back. And then he went on to become champion. So even though, you know, he won the title and didn't and didn't get to win it in front of people because, you know, pandemic, it was still a good moment for him. So it was cool. And then, of course, you fast forward to now and Brock Lesnar gets shockingly eliminated by Bobby Lashley. And this was awesome because I was just sick and tired of Bobby Lashley punking him out. And I, I'm not going to talk about that anymore more than I already have on previous episodes. But just know I was happy that Brock Lesnar got eliminated by Bobby Lashley in such a shocking way. There are so many parallels between 2020 and 2023 when it comes to the Royal Rumble. It's just insane. It's really insane how it happened. Um... And then, of course, you have Ricochet, who (laughs) flew in the air like Superman at Logan Paul in this year's Royal Rumble in something that will probably live forever. And I'm more than sure this is something that they'll put up in a museum one day. So this was pretty sick stuff right here. Like, I could not even believe this had happened. But yeah, this was amazing. Um, yeah this was just great i talked about it more in my royal rumble review so if you haven't gone and listened to that episode please go back and listen to it where i talk more in depth about this moment here but it was great but i will give credit where credit is due carmelo and ricochet ate that up first this is a carmelo hey stan account and we are fully on the agenda of him being an xc champion so yeah i'll always give them credit for that and considering that happened on my birthday too they get more credit for that then of course in the 2020 royal rumble edge came back after nine years away from the ring due to his neck injury and his triple fusion um neck issues with that surgery he surprised us all and came back to wrestling to participate in the match with his long hair in tow and i just remember this whole day being weird anyway because of course the tragedy involving Kobe Bryant his daughter Gigi and their friends and family in that helicopter accident really just knocked the wind out of all of us right um and a part of me even contemplated like should I even watch the Royal Rumble at this point you know should I even try but I just went ahead and did it anyway because I just wanted to know what was going to happen and I knew that I was going to start this show so I was like okay I need to watch this to try to uplift my spirits and I kid you not, when Edge came back, I was just like, whoa. It just shifted a lot of things in wrestling and also just within me, just to see him come back. Because me and my dad and my sister witnessed his last match um, at WrestleMania 27 in Atlanta. Like, after that, you know, he had defended the World Heavyweight title against Alberto Del Rio, who had won the Rumble that year. And he tore up his car with Christian (laughs) Cage. Um, And then a week later, he announced that he had to retire and he wound up relinquishing the title. And it was just a really sad thing. 
And so to fast forward to 2020 and watch this man pop up and wrestle again, we were all like this. We were all shocked. He was even shocked too. And even he said in interviews that he was shocked that he even got that reaction. And I'm just like, really? You're Edge and you hadn't wrestled in over nine years and you're shocked that you got that reaction. But you know, I'm glad he had that moment because it was almost like a collective hug that we were all giving him saying, yes, Edge, you're back. And he was hitting spears all over the place. And even though he didn't win, it was still a feel good moment to see him back in the ring. Now, of course, he went on to um, have multiple feuds with various people like Randy Orton and so many others. And now he has a beef going on with the Judgment Day because they decided to attack him and his wife. And that's the faction that he started. But, you know, this is where we're at. And it's just so crazy. Now, I also mentioned how on my episode I was talking about various things that I had even forgot it happened. And I forgot that Sami Zayn had started a united front or like a little bit of a baby faction with Claudio slash Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. I completely forgot that that happened. And I was like, are you serious? He was a manager for these two. And I just couldn't even... It was so stunning to me. I was just like, what? He was the mouthpiece for Cesaro and Shinsuke. Because now it's coming back to me. He was doing this to advocate for them. Because he felt like they weren't getting the opportunities that they deserved. And he was advocating for them. And I believe they went on to either win tag team gold. Or one of them won the IC. I believe Shinsuke was the Intercontinental Champion. And it was just a lot going on. But I, but just seeing Sammy as a mouthpiece back then. Blew my mind to bits. Because, of course, you know, you're watching them now, you're just like, whoa, that's crazy. And then you have Claudio, who's no longer with the company, but he's the Ring of Honor, you know, world champion. And then you have Shinsuke, who's still technically with WWE, but we really haven't seen much of him since his past match with the great Muda um, at the beginning of the year. It's just like, you know, where you at, Shinsuke? You know, come back. But you fast forward to now, and you look at where Sami Zayn <laughs> was at. He was really with the bloodline all that time, you know, now. And, you know, he was standing with these men, made family with this, with, with this, you know, with these men and just, you know, created a, a good little family with them or whatnot. And now it's all over. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing absolutely stunning breathtaking storytelling here Woo! now like i said earlier if you want to hear me talk about it listen to the royal rumble review episode of the hardy wrestling podcast because girl boy person i get into it and it's insane so Sami Zayn's standing on his own two feet now needless to say but it's crazy when you think about how in 2020 he was just a mouthpiece for two other people and now he's standing on his own two feet after having been associated with this faction for so long I counted and I have as it stands now 121 episodes of this show It's five seasons um, of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast Um, since February the 8th of 2020. I've transitioned into video and audio because I just wanted people to see my face more. The more I got comfortable on camera um, from doing women's wrestling talk, which is highly responsible for me becoming comfortable on camera, like as you see me right now. Um... I believe I also grew a whole lot with my interviewing because I never really interviewed anybody um, from a media or from a news perspective like this before, Um, like right here where I'm talking to Izzy or even where I'm, you know, talking on a stream with somebody. I had never done that before. So in starting my podcast and in knowing that I wanted to talk to people in wrestling, 
um, whether it be in media or athletes or referees or whoever, I knew I needed to like teach myself how to interview people. So I would just write questions down that I would just want to ask them. And the first question is always, when did you fall in love with wrestling? And I got that from the movie Brown Sugar. You know, if you know what that is, that's a movie with Tay Diggs and Sanaya Lathan in it. And Sanaya Lathan's character, Sydney, you know, was the editor in chief of Double XL, which is a hip hop magazine or was a hip hop magazine. I'm not sure if it still exists now. But she would ask a lot of these people who were famous rappers, she would ask them, when did you fall in love with hip hop? And I took it from that and said, well, when did you fall in love with wrestling? And that's where the conversation tends to open up a whole lot more. Um, And I would write down questions that apply to the person specifically. um, After, of course, doing research and looking into, you know, the person on social media and looking at their matches, if they were wrestlers and stuff like that, and their interview styles or their commentary styles or whatnot. And I would just ask them questions and just talk. Um... And at the time when I was just doing audio interviews, I was on my phone. Like, I was just on my phone like this. I kid you not, like, interviewing, like, well, why were you doing this? Or how are you doing this? Or blah, 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 blah. Let me, like, let me make the screen bigger for y'all can see. This was me doing interviews on my phone. Like, (laughs) speaker, sending links via Anchor. And them having to answer the link from wherever, whatever message inbox they would have to answer it. And I would talk to them on speakerphone. That's how I was doing the show. And it was weird, but I did it. And then I would get irritated whenever there would be people on the outside of, of my house cutting grass or yelling or doing all kinds of stupid things. And <laughs> I would try and record because I'm just trying to make it sound good, trying trying to make it sound professional as possible. And all these and all these entities are getting in my way. But either way, I took that process and kept doing it, you know, and making it better. Bit by bit, I have like three notebooks where I've asked people, where I've written down questions for people that I was either interviewing or supposed to have interviewed or nothing worked out and so many different things. I've made outlines of my show because like I said in my first episode, there was no outline. There was not news and gossipish story time segment, what I liked in wrestling. There was none of that. Like I went into it just completely blind and um I just didn't know what I was doing and I was just like why am I doing this but then the more I sat and thought about it and the more I had time to really do it and just think about my sections and think about how I wanted it to be like a full scale show I was just like okay well we're gonna do it like this we're gonna have news here we're gonna have gossip here we're gonna do this here and do this and do this here and all I knew was that I just wanted to create a show that was inviting and warm and relaxing and something you could listen to you know while you're just chilling out and if you were interested in wrestling you could listen to it and not feel like it was so harsh because in some areas of wrestling podcast land it can get really rough really um it can get really passionate of course but it can get really heated at times as well and it can be really overwhelming so I just wanted to give that sort of um atmospheric difference with that which is chill music in the background and you can just listen to it and not have anything too ratchet happen and um with the work that i've put in to interview people um audio wise and on video later i've gotten way better at my skills like I have not gone to school for any of this. I did not go to school for communications. I went to school for music. Um, So I was just going by what I've seen in interviews in my whole life. Because all I've ever done is watch the news, watch Oprah, watch ESPN, watch all these news things and watching how people interview folks. And I was just copying that to the best of my ability. But yet applying it to where it seemed real from my perspective. And as you can see... um, it's worked out really well. I'm not as nervous when I come when it comes to asking people things now. Like I still get nervous, but I'm not as nervous as I used to be. And 
stuff like this happens like in this picture and it's just like I felt like just a ragamuffin doing a new thing and now I'm on stages with wrestling icons and I have a community and it's just crazy and then I transitioned into commentary and <laughs> um this was an amazing thing for me to do because it's just like Casey shout out to her and Veronica took a chance on me after only listening to a few seconds of my of, of the podcast you know just audio and I was just like bro what like y'all want me okay and because this is an all woman's um promotion in Alabama I wanted to participate in it because I'm so passionate I love women's wrestling so much um and since this is happening this was happening in my hometown I was just like you know what? well not in my hometown in my home state because this is in Gaston um <laughs> which is about two hours well maybe an hour or so away from me it's just like I just had to try and participate in it and I knew I had never commentated before I had only listened to commentary but I was like well if I can tell you know all these people what's going on and make little quips and stuff as a color commentator then maybe I should do that and being able to do that with um the funeral director Scott Reznor and um Sean in this picture is just insane I can't even believe I get to put on like headphones and talk into a microphone and people actually like what I'm saying and the first time I commentated and I commentated a show which was Belladonna Genesis where Jazz was on the card a first ballot hall of famer um an iconic women's wrestler was on the card and this was during her retirement tour and I asked her I was like Jazz what do you want me to say about you like I asked all the girls this but I said Jazz what do you want me to say about you like how do you want me to you know to put you over on commentary she was just like you know do what you want and I was just like what <laughs> do what I want what do you mean <laughs> you're jazz like what like I can't do what I want because if I do what I want I don't want to make you like sound like make, like go crazy or sound like I'm dumb or something like that but I got her information and hopefully you know it turned out to sound okay and hopefully you know Casey and Veronica were okay with it and hopefully and then of course you know I went on to commentate for other Belladonna events as well as um commentate guest commentate for Battle Club Pro at Welcome to War and call the action for Big Swole versus um Jordan Blade for the um Icons Championship and that was an honor because I love Big Swole so much um and I respected her so much from especially since I saw her in the May Young Classic. I just loved her and the idea of getting to meet her and call her action was just insane. And talking to Jordan Blade and meeting her and watching her growth as a wrestler has been nothing short of a joy. And then moving forward to commentate with Faye Jackson, who was just an iconic women's wrestler um, in the Indies who came out of retirement at Black Girl Magic 2, where we commentated together was just amazing getting to finally meet her. I'd heard so much about her, so getting to meet her finally was just amazing, and she was just so fun to be with on commentary. Um, if you want to go back and listen to how we both did, you can go on Title Match Network and subscribe and watch Black Girl Magic 2, or you can go on YouTube and actually look up some of the matches there. Like, getting to call action for people who are like superstars in the indies or people who have gone on to get signed like willow nightingale like she fought on this card a part of thick and juicy 2.0 and now she's on aew like that's the type of stuff that you just can't make up and it's just so beautiful to call action for all of these women like Big Body Strella, like Maserati Lazarus, and like and Trisha Dora, oh my god, who's just taking the world by storm. Like, I get to do this. Like, who am I? Like, how am I worthy of I'm trying not to cry? Any of this. Um, how in the world did I get here? It's insane. And then, of course, I'm a panelist. <laughs> I got to be a panel uh, on a panel for Black Wrestle Fest, um, where I finally got to meet Katrina from In Cat We Trust face to face and my woman's wrestling talk sister. And 
that led to her asking me to be a part of her panel for women of color in wrestling which took place for the first time in new york comic-con and getting to participate in this with karen bam bam who is who was also in black girl magic too and who was also an amazing wrestler in her own right you know breaking down barriers for black women in wrestling and with Lo from Wrestling Wind Down, who has already accomplished so much and actually, I believe, did go to school for this because she has been on the show before. She actually did go to school for this. And, you know, it's just, you know, she's a full on professional. And with Shay, who's finding more of her voice as a host of Unpopular Review and on Women's Wrestling Talk as well. And also with Hearts from Talk of Champions and with hearing her stories as a booker, like, sharing space with these women who love and respect me is just like insane and then being able to take this convention with Katrina on the road with doing it here doing it digitally in um the UK and then also doing it in Los Angeles with an entire with an entire new group of women in Los Angeles based out of you know there um it just means the world to me to be able to talk about my experiences as a black woman in wrestling because it's not always easy because for every high like today which is my anniversary and for every great thing that's accomplished with every episode and every interview there's always that one person on tiktok who likes to insult you and make it seem like you're doing too much with a certain wrestling tape or they'll insult you by calling you a stereotypical black name like Keisha and tell you to be quiet. There's always somebody in the comment section saying that you suck as a commentator and all the above. It gets hard sometimes. You have you take pictures and you have people calling you fat and saying that you need a gym membership, not knowing that you've been struggling with body image stuff since college. Like there is so much that people just don't understand or don't necessarily see from me all the time because I put up a strong face. But it gets hard sometimes. And then there's also the idea of you being your own worst enemy and you fighting thoughts, you know, of negativity where you feel like you don't belong and you feel like you shouldn't be doing this or you feel like you really could just sit down. And when is it going to be my turn to actually do this for a full on full time living and possibly, you know, have people listen to me on a national scale? Like, when is it going to be my turn and all this other stuff? But I try to fight past that and continue to understand that there is a purpose behind all of this and that God has me here for a reason so oh god it's just been crazy and then like I mentioned earlier women's wrestling talk has helped me grow and given me more opportunities than I could have ever hoped to have had like TK Trinidad and Sarah the Rebel also known as Razor, um, on Wild Superheroes. Actually wanting me to be a part of the thing blows my mind because, like I said, they were, like, looking for people to join the network and I was just like, okay, this is TK and I knew her from After Buzz TV because I used to watch her, all her and Emily, all of the time um, on After Buzz going over stuff with wrestling all the time and I was just like, bruh, like... They don't know what my face looks like. I don't know if they'll want me. Would they care? Whatever. And so I was just like, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to send them this thing. And I hesitated for a minute, but I did. And I'm so glad that they asked me to be a part of it because it has done nothing but help me grow more and have confidence in on-camera work and interviewing work and trusting myself as a host to actually lead and mediate a conversation about wrestling in a healthy way where everybody gets to be heard and you know I can share my um thoughts and views in a healthy way and then move the conversation forward and even hosting after shows like wow the wow after show and like the smackdown rampage after show and when I was you know doing the nxt after show like stuff like that really did help me grow my muscles and um help me to just continue to improve my interviewing work and my hosting work and being a representative for women's wrestling talk at nwa weekend for empower that 
really lit the fire under my butt that I really needed that really made me feel like I could do this like interviewing Mickey James interviewing awesome Kong interviewing Melina like interviewing Renee Michelle interviewing Jazz all the all the women most of the women who participated in it interviewing Deanna Perazzo even though I effed up royally in front of her um naming the wrong championship that was on the line oh my god I'm I, that lives in my head rent free but either way and getting to talk to Tootie Lynn who is a friend of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast too like talking to those women and even Masha Slamovich who's on Impact now like talking to those women that weekend really did set the standard for what I felt what I feel like I could do like that weekend really like made me feel like I could do anything when it came to women's wrestling or even just media work period and I hope to continue with women's wrestling talk as long as I can and continue to help it you know grow as a brand and continue to help it you know gain more you know notoriety however I can through whatever hard work I have to do um and hopefully I won't kill myself in the process <laughs> but either way I hope I can continue to help it grow and I'm just so grateful to TK and for Sarah the Rebel for hearing something in me that was worth um being a part of their network um I'll always be grateful to them for that and yeah I got nominated the Hardy Wrestling Podcast got nominated for an Alabama Music Award and that was amazing and I love that experience of getting to talk to talk about wrestling to people who otherwise probably would have never talked about it before in that type of atmosphere that was amazing um I loved that and if well before I get to that part if there's anything that I am also grateful for more that the Hardy Wrestling Podcast has given me is that it's, it's given me a community of people who care. And I'm going to like name them all right now because I didn't have time to find pictures of all of you guys. I'm so sorry. Um, But the people that I have to thank, I have to thank Rob Williams from the Bob Culture Podcast. I have to thank Miranda Morales um, because she was the one who introduced, who told me about Casey looking for commentary. But then before that, um, she was friends with Rob and then we got to know each other a whole lot more. And she's been on this show twice. And I can't thank her enough for all of her support and um, all of her love. I want to thank Derek Gamble, who was the host, who is the host of Rap and Wrestling, Rap and Wrestle, I'm sorry, um, and Wrestling IQ 101. Um, they were the first, and also Tyron Asbury. They were the first big collection of family that I found in this space. And when I first started, like, I didn't really know that many people, but they, whatever questions I had, I asked them almost everything. And I am so happy that I that they were in my corner and they are still in my corner like to this day like I know I don't message them as much as I used to um but at the same time I'm still grateful for them in that community I'm grateful for those wrestling girls for seeing me um and for actually being featured on shows with me when I didn't necessarily have all this equipment um I want to thank O Face Wrestling. I don't even know if that show is still active, but that host, I don't even remember his name and I'm so sorry. And it's not because I'm not trying. It's just, I was on his show real early and, you know, we did watch alongs together. And I remember having so much fun with that. Like those were really fun. And I want to thank Blurred Over because they were supportive of me from the beginning too. Um, with Micah, who I met at Alabama Comic Con in 2019. Thank you um, for your love and your support. Um, and I want to thank Jared, who was also supportive of me as well with that too. And I want to thank Jobber Tears because the first time I saw them, I saw them on Instagram. And I didn't know exactly who they were, but I was just like, you know, they're talking about wrestling, so it's cool. Um, and I thought they were like famous, 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 even back then. Um, but now, you know, it seems like they're getting more and more famous. And 
Um, <laughs> and they're actually working in wrestling more and more. Janelle's an o- Janelle's like a part owner of Battle Club Pro. Wilkins was a wrestler. He's retired now. Um, and he had his match that I actually sponsored with Sir- with um, Simon Miller from What Culture. Um, and that was the first match I ever sponsored. And it's Mr. Black, who was the first member of the Jobber Tears podcast I ever met because I was on his show that was an offset of Jobber Tears, um, the Mr. Black show. Um, he's a referee now, and they've just grown so much. And I'm so grateful that they even mentioned my name because they ain't got to do that. They don't. And since I met them, you know, in New York, they have done nothing but show me love and help me. Um, Janelle's my subway buddy and she knows what that is. So I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for um, Christina for face, face, um, for high heels, face beat podcast. And I know I'm messing up the names of these podcasts. I'm so sorry. But it's been a long day and I'm really emotional, but I'm just really happy for you guys supporting me too. Um, thank you. And just thank everybody who's ever had me on their show. And I'm grateful for anybody that's ever wanted to come on my show, even up until this point. Because sometimes I'd be sending emails to people who I would love to have on my show. And sometimes they either don't answer because life is busy or sometimes I take it hard and just be like, oh my God, these people think I'm lame. They don't want to be on my show. Like, I be beating myself up, guys. And I shouldn't, but I do. Um, but for anybody who sees my show and actually sees me as an inspiration or sees my show as something to aspire to, I'm grateful for that because... This show has given me so much more to live for because I had worked for so long in one area, which was music and singing, and that didn't work out after I graduated from college because it just didn't. And I don't know if it was a me thing or a situational thing where it just didn't work out, but it just didn't work out. And wrestling has always been something that I had always loved I never quit loving it and the idea that wrestling is giving me something else that I can actually do where people actually listen to me and actually want to hear my voice from an intellectual standpoint it it makes me so happy and it gives me purpose like purpose unparalleled and I know I work really hard but it's just because I really love what I do And because I love what I do, I want to thank all the guests and everybody who's ever helped me build this show in any way, who's ever helped edit, especially Faith. Thank you. Um, Josiah, thank you for the theme song, Russell and Flo, forever. Thank, I want to thank Simon Vision Media for the intro, for the beginning of it. Like, thank you for your help for that. I want to thank, oh my God, um my boyfriend for being supportive of me through all of this because he was with me when I thought I wanted to be the next Beyonce and he told me early in our relationship whatever whenever I would ask him like what ifs like what if I got called to preach or what if I did this he would be like look whatever you decide to do thank you um whatever you decide to do I'm here um for that and he has been the living embodiment of supportive throughout the whole thing. And Najakwin, I don't know if you're watching this or if you're listening to this. I love you so much. And hopefully one day, you know, I can be rich and pay you back um, for all of the everything that you've put into this, whether it's been money or whether it's been helping me travel or all of the things like being more my moral support telling me I can do it when I feel like I can't do it like (laughs) thank you thank you so much um and to the friends I've made along the way via women's wrestling talk or anywhere else thank you because y'all inspire me to want to do better and just be better and evolve more just thank y'all so much because three years is a while to commit to something and 
even during a pandemic where everything just seemed like everything was just falling apart and even continuing to do this even after um my life almost fell apart last year with my mom not even last year but the year before with my mom getting sick and not being sure if I could continue but it's like I said on Instagram today my mom said like I've never seen you so happy I've never seen you so happy doing anything like you are with this and uh hopefully that can continue to happen because she's right talking about wrestling makes me happy and talking about it with friends <laughs> makes me the happiest I have I've been in so long and tweeting about it is it makes me so happy so um if I can get to this point and talk about what I want for my future if one day this show can grow about can grow into a way where I'm like Oprah or Tamron Hall um and talking about wrestling um with people like in a talk show type of way or like on ESPN or something that would be really cool because ESPN like a network and even Fox sometimes like they'll talk about wrestling um off and on but they won't necessarily talk about it as consistently as they do other sports and maybe one day a network can come about or maybe ESPN will like carve out a space where wrestling media people can come on and talk about wrestling in a way that's healthy um and cool in the way that they talk about other sports and I can be like the Oprah or the Tamron Hall of wrestling where I can have wrestlers on and then we can talk about wrestling and life stuff and you know talk about how they sort of keep themselves together life-wise and what their motivations are um in terms of their love and for the sport and what their interests are outside of it like on a talk show type of way like that's something I've thought about and this is the first time I've shared it publicly I believe um what I would want for my show like if the Hardy Wrestling Podcast became the Hardy Wrestling show then that would be amazing um I would love that um ESPN if they open that up then that would be cool or if we had our own wrestling network where we talked about wrestling in that way, that would be cool. Um, and then another thing that I'm open to is the idea of being a commentator. Like, as you can see, Renee um, here, when she was with WWE, like WWE has only ever outside of Renee and Beth Phoenix and Lita have only ever had like men on their commentary desk and I've talked about ad nauseum how I feel like women should have more intellectual space in wrestling because men are not the only ones who know about wrestling. Men are not the only ones participating in the matches and calling the action and stuff like that. Um, women are doing this everywhere all over the world. So if that's the case, then why don't you have more people, more women in the intellectual space? And if um, I have to be if the Lord makes it so I am the first black woman to commentate whether it be in WWE Impact Wrestling or WOW Superheroes I will be very open to that um, I open that with welcome arms because I know I'm not a professional and I know there would be a whole lot that I would have to learn but I would be willing to learn it because um, it would be amazing and it would be amazing for diversity for the culture like it would just be awesome so um that's something else that I would want um and yeah here's wow and it's so funny because on wow superheroes you know you got AJ Mendez who sits between Stephen Dickey and um David McClain who helped create wow um well didn't help create he did found found wow um so you know if they want to add another woman you know I'm your girl um if you if there's ever any openings for a commentator and if you want to do tryouts do you know do that and maybe I'll see you at some point but that would be amazing um because we need more women in these spaces and we definitely need more women of color in these spaces as well um and more women on 
pre-shows too that needs to happen as well because I love my Kayla but I'm tired of just seeing just men in these spaces like there needs to be more of us yeah I don't recall um not on the mainstream level no so I mean if that's if that's something that can happen then I'm more than open to being that representative or maybe there's or maybe there'll be two of us or three of us either way there needs to be more of us but that's the end of what my hopes are for the hardy wrestling podcast and for myself so now we're here at the um jesus christ call to action (laughs) i'm sorry guys so i hope you've enjoyed this episode of the hardy wrestling podcast this anniversary episode so if you haven't had a chance please go on foyerwear.com slash hardy wrestling podcast and buy the alabama wrestling t-shirt um it's a select your fighter mode so on the t-shirt you have paul bearer aqa fuego del sol deborah kayla braxton like i previously mentioned teddy long who has been on the podcast before in the early days of hardy wrestling podcast and sensational sherry who celebrates a heavenly birthday today i can't tell you how shocked i was to find out that i share that the hardy wrestling podcast as an entity shares an anniversary date with sensational sherry's birthday because if you may or may not know sensational sherry was born in birmingham alabama just like me um and sadly she passed away before we could give her more of her flowers even though she is a hall of famer um but um the idea that that connection is just out there it's just insane to me i would have loved to have met her um or interviewed her but either way just it's just insane how that happened like today's your birthday like when amy um from new south pro wrestling or new era pro wrestling i'm sorry i'm blanking on names again posted it was her birthday i wanted to just faint (laughs) i just wanted to faint like excuse me so you mean to tell me i founded the hardy wrestling podcast on sensational sherry's birthday and we're both from birmingham and we're trying to make and she made her space in wrestling and i'm making my space this is the kind of stuff that you really just can't make up i promise none of this happened on purpose but with more and with more um announcements i will be um at comic con in birmingham this weekend um not every day this weekend because of course friday i do have to go to work but saturday i'll more than likely be there um so please come to the table as we talk wrestling or i might not be there it's just you know i've had a really busy week so if i'm not there then please don't be mad um but i've had a really tiresome week like between the anniversary and other things i have to do like it's just a lot going on so please don't take it personally because i do love you guys um but sometimes i work so hard and i just need a little bit of a break so if you see me at comic-con great but if you don't see me don't judge me please um (laughs) but yeah that's pretty much all that's happening now when it comes to announcements and such so oh sorry that's old stuff but um Thank you for those who watched this live stream of the third anniversary episode, Three Years High and Rising. And hopefully, you know, this show will continue to last as long as it possibly can. Um, um, Until, of course, you know, more opportunities arise and more things happen with me in my life as a wrestling, as a member of the wrestling community. Um, So if I hope that wherever you are wherever you're listening wherever you're watching that you're having a good day good night good week good year so far um and i hope you know that this is a lesson i had to learn from starting a podcast myself um where you are wherever you're starting from is enough because it's like i said earlier I never imagined I'd be doing this. I never imagined that anybody would ever want to listen to me. Um, I never imagined that anybody would want to like ever talk wrestling with me or ever want to listen to me in this space, but people are. And I've had so many blessings happen from this. So, um, so the lesson that I just want to leave you guys with is to just believe in yourself from where you are, because I promise 
you might not think it's enough, but to somebody, it really just might be enough. And your blessings can be on the other side of the doubt that you have or the belief that you have that where what you have or from where you are isn't enough. I promise it is enough because I started this thing on my phone on speakerphone and it's taken me all these different places. So um, you, everybody has to start somewhere. But I promise that on the other side of that starting, there's more on the other side. So yeah. Thank you for supporting the Hardy Wrestling Podcast um, with your girl Stephanie Hardy. Please follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Queen Steph Hardy. Um, follow the Hardy Wrestling Podcast on Instagram at Hardy Wrestling Podcast and on Twitter at Hardy Wrestle Pod. Like, share, and subscribe on YouTube at the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, where you can find the logo up there. Um, and just continue to support the movement and just look out for me wherever you can because I be everywhere and because I be everywhere you just never know where I might pop up and that's just the truth of it I'm blessed in that way and I praise God for it so until next time this is your girl Stephanie of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast and until next time bye y'all and thank you